Glad you could uh, join us today. Uh, this is a recording of the Strange But True Process Control Stories. It reflects over 40 years of uh, my experience uh, and uh, things learned the hard way in the field uh, by things not going uh, as someone might expect it, whether it's me or uh, the plant or uh, some very intelligent people who are in technology. So uh, here is a straight scoop on what I've learned, uh, at least uh, about 20 of the stories. Uh, you probably know me by now, so I don't need to linger here. So let's start with the setup for War Stories uh, 1 through 6. Guidelines dating back six decades uh, uh, basically all say uh, the same thing. A fast loop should not have positioners. And if a valve needs to be faster, a booster should be used. And we still hear that today. Guidelines did not take into account the practical limitations where a control valve without a positioner will differ by 25% or more from the valve signal. In an unsafe situation of positive feedback between the booster high outlet port sensitivity and an actuator diaphragm flexure can develop from using a booster without a positioner. And that's kind of complicated, but we'll get into some example of that and explain that a little bit better as we get into some of these war stories. Control valve specs ask for an allowable leakage, leading users to believe that lower leakage is a better valve. Control valve specs do not require a valve to respond to signals. The type of valve that has the lowest leakage has the poorest response. On-off piping valves are often posing as throttling valves as a result. No matter how you dress up a pig, you still have a pig. In other words, if you take a, an on-off piping valve and you put on a fancy positioner and, and dress it up uh, and you get a lot of fancy diagnostics, uh, you really have essentially a crummy valve in terms of throttling. On-off valves should not be used for throttling. Control valves should not be used for isolation. These are separate purpose valves with designs based on those separate objectives. War Story 1. Positioners on fast loops. Well, back in 1976, uh, on uh, the world's largest uh, new acrylonitrile plant, um, the contractor, a very experienced engineer, gosh, you know, I was you know, in my 20s at that point, but, uh, uh, but he was, uh, you know, in his 40s and been working on E&I design as a lead E&I person for in many years, and he said, let's save money and not use positioners on the fast loops per the white paper and many other guidelines he had seen published. Well, we started up, and the plant said, good grief, valves not open when the output is 25%. There seems to be no correlation with PID output and valve position. Me, well, uh, I said, put positioners on all the valves. You know, this would take some time, and there was about a thousand valves, so it cost quite a bit of money, but it was the right thing to do. Plant says, well, the fast loops work great, and the valve position now matches the PID output pretty well. Well, if you would think you'd be past that back in, in 1990, uh, you know, uh, you know, decades later, uh, a, a very uh, well-known fellow who specialized in um, valves and, and getting the right valve uh, said, uh, for all the new plants in Asia, uh, let's save money and not use positioners 
on fast loops, per the white paper and the guidelines published. Craig E. Uh, no way. The concern of the cascade rule violation is not an issue due to the way flow loops are tuned. Plus, external reset feedback and endure DCS can deal with slow valve response to prevent oscillation. Or story two, surge control valves. Uh, me, in 1984, I go onto a plant and say, well, Nyquist plant study, uh, and there's a very distinguished uh, technologist at the uh, supplier, uh, says valves on fast loops uh, should have boosters instead of positioners. This surge control loop must be incredibly fast. Uh, the compression go into surge in less than a second. Take off the positioner and put on this new volume booster. My technician said, you need a positioner, but I'll do what you say. The plant, that night, when they started up the compressor, uh, they told me in the morning that the surge valve was slammed shut upon its opening, causing a shutdown of the compressor. I mean, uh, this is the worst possible thing, that a surge valve designed to protect a compressor from going in a surge is slammed shut. Technician, the next day, says, hey, let's go to the field. And he says, see, I can move this 24-inch bar fly with only a booster by grabbing this, this stem. Uh, I can move, uh, I can't move an adjacent valve with a positioner. And then he tried a, another valve that had a, uh, an I2P but no positioner and no booster. And he could kind of budge it a little bit. But it was only the valve uh, with a booster and no positioner that you could uh, freely move, even though it was a huge valve, a 24 inch. Greg, uh, uh, that's me. <laughs> I said, hey, uh, put the positioner back on and put the booster on the positioner output and open the booster bypass just enough to stop the high frequency oscillation. The plant then said, hey, uh, after starting up again, uh, the valve operation is fast and smooth. Uh, they were very happy. Uh, we had good surge protection and uh, no no strange things happening with the surge valves. Now, first control valves. You would think fast valve requirements may be limited uh, just to compressors, but also I've had uh, a few furnaces. Uh, one furnace could uh, ramp off scale in uh, a tenth of a second, and there we had to go with analog control and a variable frequency drive. Uh, but in these uh, furnaces, I mean, it, it might take five seconds or or more to ramp off scale, and, and you could use control valves if they were fast enough. So in 1986, I said, this phosphorus furnace pressure can ramp off scale. Now I said in a couple of seconds, that's probably an exaggeration, it's probably about five seconds. We have a special fast controller execution rate and a minimum damping setting. We need valves with a response time of less than two seconds. The supplier. Well, here are the valves all set up in our test facility. They are as fast as you want it. We replaced the positioners with volume boosters. And I thought to myself, oh, no. I said, see how I can grab the shaft of these 20-inch valves and move them. The supplier says, hmm, you don't look that strong. Let's uh, check with an old timer. Uh, and then I said, please, put the volume boosters on the output of the positioner and crack open the bypass valve just enough to stop the high-frequency cycle. Supplier, uh, you are right. Old-timer dug up 1958 article confirming this. Furthermore, the test results were all then great. War story four, slurry control valves. Plant, we have our favorite new ball valves with the latest smart positioner. The positioner diagnostics and readback shows the valve was responding precisely to the signal, but the process is oscillating. There's no flow measurement. We have imagined if I did as to where the oscillations are coming from in the process. To give you some background, these favorite new ball valves were the ones used by piping for on-off control, and it was a tough service. It was phosphorus, and so. Uh, they thought this was the best solution, so they took these uh, on-off isolation valves and put positioners on them. Me, I said, let's look at the ball movement in the shop. So, you know, it's not easy to get people convinced to take the valve out, but we did. 
and we put it on the bench, and, then, and the actuary shaft that is readback moves in response to the signal. So the positioner is seeing movement in the actuary shaft, but the ball does not move or changes less than 8% due to shaft wind up from a key lock shaft to stem and a pinned stem to ball connection. These connections have a play in them, believe it or not, and excessive friction of the seal to achieve the tight shutoff. So you have play in connections and you actually have shaft windup going on here. Really for rotary valves, you want a splined shaft connection between the uh, actuator shaft and the stem. Furthermore, you want the stem to be integrally cast with the ball or disc or whatever the rotary internal closure a member is. Well, not too much later, uh, I, I was on another application, different plant and entirely, uh, and the shop said, uh, hey, uh, we have the plant's favorite low leakage butterfly valves. You know, it was, uh, you know, from the piping spec. Uh, uh, with the latest smart positioner for all of the air feeds, and these were huge air feeds. Uh, the position of diagnostics and readback shows the valve is responding quickly and precisely. Here are the screen sprints. It is impressive and is ready to go. Let's put a travel gauge in that disc. And, and here we are in the shop, but nobody, they were in a separate room looking at the computer screen with the diagnostics on the positioner, and then nobody really went out to the valve and, and right outside you know, that little room in the shop to look to see what the disc was. So I said, let's put a travel gauge on the disc. And I said, good grief. The actuator shaft has feedback moves in response to the signal, but the disc does not move for changes less than 8% due to shaft windup and slop from a key lock sh 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 shaft to stem and a pin stem to disc, disc connection and excessive friction of the seal to achieve the tight shut off you were so impressed with. You have an isolation valve pulling in a throttling valve line to a smart positioner. Now, uh, let's look at uh, pH control valves. Uh, and there the requirements of, can be uh, really significant. This is what got me introduced, I think, to why, why I had to really look into how valves could respond to small signals. And, and what oscillations they might just get from uh, the valve uh, friction and, and backlash. And, but this wasn't a particularly uh, difficult pH loop. The titration curve was that steep. And, uh, and I said, great, I see where you have throttling valves uh, with better than 0.4% dead band, 0.2% resolution. That will meet my control requirements uh, for a customer's uh, pH loop. Um, the supplier says, uh, the dead band is actually 0.8%. The resolution is 0.4% based on the size of actuator stock to make sure the valve is uh, cheap uh, for competitive bids. And, you know, they didn't say this, of course, but the name of the game, basically, that's being played here is cheap, cheap, cheap. And then I asked, can we order the valve with a larger actuator? And the supplier said, it will become a special and the delivery will be 16 weeks. Uh, this is too late to meet the plant requirements. Supplier, you can order a control valve designed for research labs. They just bought a, a, a supplier of that, and they look pretty. And, uh, you know, for research labs, you know, maybe they were okay because it's a very protected environment. But I said, no, thanks. The diameter of the stem is so small, the stem can easily be bent in the plant from just handling and stuff bumping into it. Well, here we take a break with a, a top ten list, which, uh, if you know me, I, I have a history of uh, probably a couple hundred of these. Uh, top ten things you don't want to hear on startup. We never really could figure out what the old system was doing. Do I have a system backup? I thought you were making backups. They want to make our startup into a reality show. 
The displays are fine and dandy, but where are the panel boards? <laughs> you know the operators are not on board. They were looking for panel boards and didn't have training in the use of the new uh, DCS. We have changed our mind. Uh, we want the old system back because, again, they don't have the training to understand the new system. Can you reprogram it so the wrong valve still works? And that has actually been requested. Actually, all of these things have happened uh, at one time or another. Uh, didn't you get the revised batch sheets? It's a blue screen bed. What is that burning smell? Now, fortunately, this was food burning in the kitchen uh, that the operators uh, would normally be attentive to, but they were so busy that the console was dealing with problems. And so, uh, you know, their, 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 their lunch or dinner was, was burning, and, and that's not a good situation. We are out of coffee. Boy, if you only have time to make coffee, you got problems. Please, let's not go backwards and instead realize the value of technology and the advances that have been made significantly in the design of real throttling valves. Use on-off and isolation valves for sequences and safety instrument systems, SIS, and use low friction, uh, low friction, and low backlash throttling valves with smart positioners for loops. Many loops require both types of valves. If size and process conditions per permit, preferably use sliding stem globe valves. Here, there, there is no backlash, essentially. With diaphragm actuators, which are very sensitive, and ultra-low friction ULF packing uh, that uh, minimizes friction. And if you have a sliding stem globe valve designed for throttling, it's not going to have uh, excessive friction and near the closed position as well. Make sure the valve drop is at least 25% of the max system drop. Now, these days, uh, in an uh, attempt to save uh, uh, energy, uh, even the supplier may say, oh, hey, you don't need to go to a variable frequency drive because I can, uh, I can say you only need uh, maybe 5% of the max system drop at your maximum flow available to the control valve. Well, if you do this, you've lost significant rangeability and uh, you've created significant nonlinearity in the installed characteristic, particularly uh, near the closed position and uh, near the wide open position. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, if you only allocated 5% of the system drop, a linear inherent uh, characteristic would distort to a quick open installed characteristic. Uh, very bad news. Make sure the actuator is sized for 100%. 150% of max torque and thrust. And this is partially because uh, they are being rather marginal to save money uh, uh, or, you know, they're trying to save money for you by making uh, the price uh, cheaper, but really they're trying to sell more in competitive bids, really what it comes down to. And um, because the uh, torque or thrust was based on packing, for example, that uh, uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it, it was, it, I, I'm amazed to find out that it's actually based on packing uh, with lower friction. Um, that was, uh, say, a Teflon packing that you don't even get anymore uh, back in the 1970s. So if you have a higher friction packing or you've, or you've tightened the packing because you have concern about any sort of emissions, um, uh, you, you are you've got a real problem. And, you know, it, there are things that can happen in the process in terms of uh, the, uh, the, there being a buildup uh, around the internal trim uh, coating. Uh, and, you know, and, the, and there can be just corrosion in, in general of the shaft as well. And uh, so uh, things are not as ideal as they are in the book. And you need to uh, uh, take into account that they're rather marginal in their sizing to begin with, so at least 150% of max torque and thrust is advised in the actuator size. Please add the following requirements to control valve specs. And, hey, boy, I would feel so blessed if people would do this. Uh, the resolution in dead band should be added. Now, if you don't know what it is and it, it doesn't seem to be a problem in your loop, I mean, you can go with the maximum numbers here and say, oh, I just need a resolution 0.5%, 1%. That will actually prevent you from getting uh, on-off valve closing as uh, throttling valves. 
uh, won't teach you a, a valve that's uh, going to um, not have a limit cycle uh, that corresponds to uh, the resolution and dead band that you have in there, uh, but at least it uh, it, it uh, will be reasonable. Um, now, if you get into pH control, uh, you're going towards the lower limit or any sort of tight temperature and composition control. You want uh, resolutions approaching 0.1% and dead bands approaching 0.2%. Now, the uh, reason I say you need to specify the response time for small steps and large steps, for small steps you get into some weird things happening with positioners, particularly the cheap positioners and the older positioners. Uh, they wouldn't show a problem if you made step changes of 5%. Now, they might start to show a problem for changes of 0.5%, but when you get down to like 0.5%, uh, even though, you know, we had good resolution, if you make very small step changes, the position itself went bizarre. The response time would increase by an order of magnitude. In other words, if you had a good response time of four seconds for a step change of 1%, if you went down and made a step change of a quarter percent, that response time could go uh, from four seconds to 40 seconds. And then if you reverse direction, I found that uh, from somebody who's seen this, uh, quite often in the field, uh, the response time goes to 80 seconds on reverse all direction. Very, very bizarre things. And these are cheaper positioners, and I thought, well, they're not available today. But uh, if <laughs> if you go on the website, you can find them still being sold by the major manufacturers, uh, which uh, is uh, really disheartening in their lack of understanding of what's happening here. Because normally the, the changes in the controller output uh, from one execution to another uh, tend not to be that large. But then you have some situations, particularly for surge control, pressure control, particularly pressure relief control, uh, where you have large changes in controller output. And here you get into the uh, fooling rate of the valve, uh, sort of like a velocity or rate limiting and how fast it can move. And so the uh, response time gets larger, and so you need to specify for, uh, say, a large step size, like 20%, what the response time is. And, you, you know, you got to realize that uh, uh, that if you start saying one second or two seconds, you're going to end up with a booster. Um, whereas if you say 10 seconds, you may not have to do anything at all, except just make sure the positioner is tuned properly. So uh, the other thing uh, remaining here is the valve gain. And it's the slope uh, of the installed characteristic in terms of percent flow change, percent stroke. And here I'm saying you should try and reduce that that change by so it's less than a factor of four because it's going to affect the PID tuning. In other words, if uh, if it increases from a, uh, from a factor one to a factor four, if you tune the the, the PID controller aggressively for one. Uh, the PID gain would have to reduce by a factor of four. Uh, so we generally tune the PID for the steepest slope uh, on the installed characteristic, and, but we would like uh, that not to vary that much uh, with the signal. So this uh, shows the situation that I'm talking about in terms of uh, using a booster uh, on the output of a position. So despite the uh, age-old guidelines, never replace a positioner with a volume booster. It's potentially unsafe. It's that bad a scenario. Now, you put the booster on the output of the positioner uh, between it and the valve, and you have to open a bypass valve, and hopefully that, that bypass valve is integral to the booster. What this does is uh, it allows the positioner to see some of the volume of the actuator. Now, if the valve was wide open and it was a pretty big valve, you would be essentially bypassing the booster and you would see the big volume of the actuator. When it's closed, it sees a very tiny, relatively speaking, volume of that volume booster and uh, it goes unstable. It's not used to seeing uh, such a tiny volume on its, on its output of what it, the pressure it's driving. So 
So you'll get a very fast oscillation of about one cycle per second. But just opening that bypass a little bit stops it, and it's a very sudden and, and complete stop. So you open it and you stop it, and then you might open a little bit further. Now, if you open it too much, so all you've done is slow down uh, uh, the whole stroking of, of the control valve. Now, now you want a high capacity uh, filter uh, regulator. And uh, as noted in purple here on the, on the left side here, uh, based on a remark, uh, excellent remark made by Hunter Vegas, uh, that the air supply line from the air header to the booster air set must be short and dedicated to the booster. This air supply should not be shared with the positioner and any other users of air to prevent a dip and restriction in air to the booster. This booster is going to demand a large airflow. And that's the whole idea of making the valve stroke faster is to provide large airflows, uh, either fill flows or exhaust flows uh, into the actuator. Now, the, uh, the airline sizes uh, may need to be increased, and they may need to go from, say, half an inch to one inch. And in some cases, uh, also uh, increase the size of the connection to the actuator. And, and uh, you know, I, this is a hassle, but, you know, guys uh, who are, are good at uh, are doing this and threading uh, a new coupling into it, uh, you know, can take care of of that, and so we had to do that in a number of cases. Um, please use the lowest friction packing, and there is some new well-designed packings that are suitable for much higher temperatures than you normally expect that are ultra-low friction, ULF. However, they're a little bit more expensive, and so they may not be even uh, offered to you unless you, you ask for them. And the other thing uh, to be careful about is the fact that uh, uh, positioners uh, now uh, have the interval action turned on. Uh, this is a very strange situation that caught me by surprise in just this last year. Uh, the original positioners, you know, for way back when, you know, the, the original pneumatic positioners were all proportional only controlled. This is a very high gain, 50, 150, you know, very straightforward. And that's really all you needed uh, because the gain was so high and the offset is inversely proportional uh, to to the gain. We had very small offsets and we had uh, very, very tight control. Well, when they went to these smart positioners, they essentially put in a PID because, well, hey, you know, uh, PID is uh, more sophisticated than proportional only. Unfortunately, uh, the integral part got turned on recently. It should, uh, under, under, well, I don't know of any situation where it should be turned on. There was one case, but it was due to a poor design. And it was really not indicative of what uh, you should be considering. Anyway, <clears throat> the reason it is turned on is because when uh, people are looking at the response, not in closed loop control, but if they're just looking at the step response, and, and maybe this is a result of, you know, us not really being more definitive in our valve response requirements, in that it, there is a little bit of an offset, if you look at, zoom in on it, uh, for a step change in the signal, you know, once you get past the resolution or backlash step band. Um, there is a, an offset, and the interval will work on that, and it, it, the, the trend chart will look prettier. However, if if you look at what happens longer term, there will be a limit cycle develop uh, from stiction uh, just due to uh, the positioner having interval action. And then, of course, when you go and close with control and the process controller, whether it's flow controller or some other uh, process controller, uh, it has integral action. And the combination of integral action there and the integral action of the positioner uh, it not only causes limit cycles that are worse, but uh, it creates limit cycles from other things like backlash, which requires two integrators, uh, whereas fiction only required uh, one integrator. So... Uh, we really need to turn that off and, and realize the implication of closed loop control. Once you do that, you can actually use a higher gain uh, because in general in, in PID control, when you use integral action, you have to 
uh, back off on the proportional action uh, uh, accordingly. Um, and so you should be relying more on proportional and maybe derivative uh, control uh, to uh, to do the thing and the positioner. So unfortunately, uh, I don't know how to uh, straightforwardly get this uh, fixed other than it has been made known, and it's just not one manufacturer. It seems like uh, they're kind of copying each other, and I think uh, uh, several, if not all, of the valve, uh, throttling valve manufacturers uh, uh, mistakenly turned on interval action in their smart positioners, which means they're really not that smart. Uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of dumb. So the top ten things you don't want to hear from your valve supplier. I went out for bids and found the cheapest possible valves. These valves have been extensively used in packaged equipment. These valves have such a tight shutoff, I dare you to try and open them. You can standardize on these valves isolation and sequences. You get all the flow you need when the valve is just 10% open. Why do you want to know the valve response time? We have quick opening trim. Thanks to my 1969 guidelines and micro spots, I was able to omit positioners. You don't need to know the piping system. All I need is available pressure drop at the design flow. What do you mean by installed flow characteristic? I encourage you to look at this article in Control Magazine, April 2016. In fact, the online version is, is the best because it has an expensive and I really mean an extensive discussion of uh, what's going on here with valves. And I try to have a catchy title to wake people up, uh, hey, this is truth or consequences. Um, but it hasn't been that popular, I think, with the valve suppliers, and I don't think people have caught on to the significance of, uh, of, of what's really happening here. There was a lot of progress made back in the 1990s, and, and the good valve companies, starting valve companies, were showing why you should buy their valves because they were giving you a good response and minimizing uh, resolution and dead band and response time. And then something happened uh, this century where uh, those people in technology at the suppliers were kind of overruled by people trying to sell valves and just uh, make them more competitive uh, uh, yeah, for for bids, I guess. Uh, I don't know the whole story. Uh, but it's, it sure, surely shows a, a, a lack of understanding. And this is what I was trying to do, was to open people's eyes and, uh, and, and maybe even shock them as to what's happening and what are the solutions. So you, if you really want to get out, know, hopefully it's written, uh, you know, with enough... Uh, explanation and details so there are a lot of things that you can do to deal with this uh, you know although fundamentally if you have a on off valve that's flying to a position you're, you're just out of luck Okay, uh, war stories uh, 7 through 12, set up for them. Uh, <clears throat> and they're about measurement filters, or, or, or how fast a measurement is. A large measurement filter can allow a higher PID gain. Yeah, I mean, you look at the tuning. Tuning doesn't say where that time constant comes from. It, you know, in the literature, it says the process time constant, but uh, the largest time constant in the loop, uh, it doesn't have to be in the process. It can be anywhere. And here, if you put a big filter, it's uh, it, it, it's in the measurement. And But you, that's what goes in the, uh, the tuning equations, you know. Even though they say process time constant, in this case, uh, it could be the measurement time constant. And it allows you to use a higher PID gain, but you're being fooled. A large measurement filter can make the trend oscillation amplitude smaller, so it looks better on trend chart. A large measurement filter can make a, a trend chart peak error smaller for a disturbance. Again, fooling you thinking things are better. A large measurement filter is giving an attenuated version, though, of the real world. You don't know what the real world is doing unless you have a faster measurement. A large measuring filter can fool you into thinking the loop is doing better. Real loop variability is not seen. 
key is that the loop dead time period and recovery time is slower. In fact, uh, what may happen is the oscillations, they may not be very large in amplitude, but slow oscillations will break out. And this occurs for pH electrodes that get coated because they develop a very large time constant. Their normal time constant may be one or two seconds. And if they get coated, their time constant, oh, it may go up to 100 or 200 seconds. And you don't see an amplitude that's at anywhere near as large as what's happening in the process, but you see this slow oscillation that's developed that you can't get rid of. So War Story 7 on extruder control. Uh, the operator. The extruder with a temperature sensor in a massive metal block at the outlet has a smoother response than with the sensor in the melt, the actual process product coming out of the extruder. The manager, wow, let's move all temperature sensors from melt to the metal block. Our trend charts will look so much better. Marketing, customers are complaining about extruder product quality. Engineer, lab results confirm the actual temperature control is worse. Put the sensors back into the melt, and then the product quality returned. More story number eight, bioreactor control. Biochemists, see how I partially withdraw the temperature sensor in the thermal well? The temperature is much smoother. I'm running all of my pilot plant reactors this way. Me, the insulating effect of air in the thermal well is preventing you from seeing the true variations in batch temperature. War Story 9, Furnace Control. Plant. The furnace pressure trends charts look a lot worse. Ask if you install those faster transmitters, which have a 0 0.1 second versus a 1 second time constant. And that's their damping setting. It's a really a time constant. Me. Fortunately, we kept the old transmitter as an indicator. The trend chart for the old transmitter shows that the amplitude of the pressure fluctuation is actually much less, which is consistent with the fact that we have less flows of the furnace pressure. Uh, and they were getting furnace pressure blows, relief blows, uh, uh, once or twice a day. And uh, that essentially went to zero with the new transmitters, but the trend charts look like uh, things were worse. War story number 10, blast of a time with a new plant. Plant, all of the temperature loops we started up are slow and tend to oscillate with tuning settings similar to what we have in a existing plant and producing the same uh, product. Uh, so, well, let's remove and inspect the thermal well. A technician, ah, oh, there's sand in the bottom of the thermal well. Oh, okay. The, uh, the sensors were not installed, but the thermal wells must have been in the pipe in an open during sand blasting, resulting in an insulating layer of sand. We need to assemble and clean out every one. And after they did that, the temperature loops were fine. War story uh, number 11. Mistake considered almost too valuable to present. I was at a major ISA conference, and this one is when ISA conferences are really big. It was the thing. It was before user group meetings, and so they were, they were huge. I mean, uh, you had maybe 5,000 people going or more to these things. And so there was a guy making a presentation, and boy, he was so proud of uh, what he had discovered. The presenter, I found through simulation that if I increase the signal filter, I can increase the PIV gain, and the amplitude of variability will be much smaller. This innovation is so impressive. My management almost did not let me give this paper because they consider it a proprietary advantage. Now, I don't think I actually said this in the meeting, but maybe privately afterwards. I probably should have said it right out in the meeting because this is, um, this is so misleading and so bad. Me, if you plot the unfiltered area, you will see it is generally worse. And he could have done this in a simulation. He just didn't bother to even think of that. War story uh, number 12, compressor control. Uh, compressors, you know, besides very fast valves, they need very fast measurements and very fast PID executions in, in general. 
The plant, we have had, uh, we have not had any compressor shutdown since you made the pressure and differential pressure transmitters faster. Um, engineer, and this wasn't me, I got this, uh, you know, from guy-do-control.com. He said, great, all the transmitters now have their damping settings decreased from the supplier's default of two seconds, down to 0 0.2 seconds, uh, filter, time constant. Plant, we had to replace one of the transmitters last night. Afterwards, we had another shutdown. Engineer, oh, the plant spare transmitter had its damping still as default, as we, you know, as I checked, you know, and I'm going to buy transmitters that c come with a 0 0.2 seconds default setting. So this won't happen again, that you don't have to depend upon somebody being uh, rec rec uh, intelligent in terms of recognizing the importance of uh, uh, making sure the transmitter is fast enough. Uh, in fact, it ought to come fast, and then if you need, uh, judiciously add in more of a filter based on a noise. So here we see the effect of transmitter damping or, uh, in general, measurement filter on compressive surge cycles. Now, the, the, the initial precipitous drop in flow is the fastest uh, event that you can have in a, in a gas system. Uh, it drops uh, to possibly zero or negative flow even in, in 0 0.03 seconds. And then the oscillations, the surge oscillations themselves, even for a, a rather large volume uh, systems, uh, is typically within uh, one or two seconds as shown here. Very fast oscillations. Uh, and so with a 16-second measuring filter, and that's Tauso then there at the top, um, you uh, don't even see what's going on. And maybe you're, you're happy because of the trend chart, but then you wonder why did it shut down why, or why is the compressor damaged from excessive surge. And then if you say, well, uh, I've got a pretty fast transmitter, and I reduced the damping setting to 1.7 seconds. Well, notice that you still don't see the oscillations, and you're very slow in recognizing the initial drop and surge. It's, it's very gradual. You, uh, you really have to reduce the damping setting to 0 0.2 seconds to see the oscillations, but you don't see the true amplitude unless you decrease the measurement filter to uh, 0 0.03 seconds. So for War Stories uh, 13 through 16, we have this set up. Um, the pH measurement offers potentially, figuratively and literally, the most extraordinary concentration measure in terms of sensitivity. For example, uh, 10 to the minus 7th, the normality of hydrogen iron concentration uh, is uh, corresponds to a pH of 7. And the rangeability for, uh, is, uh, goes from 1 to 10 to the minus 14 hydrogen ion concentration uh, for a 0 to 14 pH scale range. So we have a concentration range here in terms of hydrogen ion. But that is uh, 14 orders of magnitude. In incredible in terms of uh, the, the sensitivity and rangeability. Uh, just, just incredible. With this extraordinary capability comes extreme control challenges in terms of mixing, reagent, injection delays, valve precision, electro performance, PID, tuning, accompanied by many misperceptions. The titration curve slope and hence the process gain changes by orders of magnitude for each pH unit deviation from neutrality for strong S to strong base, unless you have CO2 absorption or conjugate salts present. People don't realize how how severe this nonlinearity is. But also, you got to make sure when you're doing modeling or design or getting actually lab titration results, make sure that you realize exposure to air causes enough CO2 absorption to dramatically affect the curve. So, if the process itself has been exposed to air, you got to make sure the sample is exposed to air. If the process was not exposed to air, you got to make sure the sample is not exposed to air that you're going to use for titration. The other thing is that if there are salts, you ought to know about that and make sure that uh, there, that sort of condition is uh, represented in the sample and also in the model uh, that you are creating. The best solution involves minimizing loop dead time, valve stiction, valve backlash, and electrode lag. 
the only way I've been able to deal with this extreme nonlinearity and sensitivity is really to be very attentive to these things and minimizing them. And then, of course, you need to maximize electrode reliability and knowledge of the titration curve. Uh, electrodes, uh, not like most other instruments today, it, you know, their lifespan, uh, even under the best conditions, may be 12 to uh, 24 months, and, and often it's a lot shorter than that uh, because of uh, either uh, propensity for coatings, that it's like the temperature is maybe just, you know, it's up around 50 degrees, and the higher it goes, the shorter the life, or it's getting exposed to uh, strong acids and strong bases. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons uh, uh, that can cause the uh, electrode life to be uh, much less. So you have to be very attentive as to that and its reliability. And then you need the knowledge of the titration curve. It's, it's, it's in order to properly size the valves and to properly tune the controller and decide whether you need to do something more sophisticated like adaptive tuning uh, or, or scheduling uh, of the gain setting. And uh, even better is if you have a good titration curve, you can use signal characterization to uh, translate uh, the uh, pH uh, as a controlled variable to the x-axis of the titration curve, which is the reagent demand. And it's simply scaled zero to 100% reagent demand. And the improvement, if you have a good titration curve and you are dealing with uh, a set point on the steep part of the titration curve, is, is uh, really incredible. Four stories, 13 E, B, C, and D for a titration curve. Me, this curve has a straight line in the control range of 5 to 9 pH. There appears to be only two data points, though, between 2 and 10 pH. Plant. Uh, that titrator did not change the titration drop size in the control range where the curve is the steepest. Common situation. Greg, different application. The curve does not show the maximum and minimum possible pH. The actual curve should be 100 feet instead of 10 inches long, which if you're going to have on a piece of paper is a little bit of a problem. Uh, Plant. Well, we thought you only wanted to know what the curve was like in the control region, you know, right around the pH set point. Well, the controller has to deal with the whole curve uh, that it's going to see in terms of dealing with disturbances. Another application. The curve looks much flatter than expected, below 7 pH. Uh, plant. Well, the titration with a strong acid was too difficult, so we used a weak acid to generate your curve. Well, this is kind of a clue here that you've got to be careful. They may substitute the agents so they make their lab titration easier. Um, and, you know, it's an indication, hey, if it's difficult from the lab, how difficult it is in the plant? Because, you know, in the plant, you have stuff coming in and stuff going out. It's like in the lab, if they had that beaker and somebody was didn't know it was being poured into it, but something... Uh, which was unidentified was being poured into it, and there was a hole in the beaker, and so you're flowing out of the beaker, and you know now you're trying to do uh, you know a pH measurement and titration. And just think of um, how difficult that that is. And you have to be careful. Also, they may use uh, a much less concentrated reagent because uh, you know they don't want to deal with 98% sulfuric or 50% caustic because again the titration drops become very small. And so if they use a diluted reagent, even if it's the same reagent, you need to take that into account and figure for the sizing of the control valve and for uh, any sort of analysis of uh, what's going on or for feed-forward control. Another application. The curve doesn't show flattening in the slope above 10 pH from line, which is a weak base. But, oh, the line took too long to dissolve, so we use diluted caustic, a strong base. Completely different curve. Work story is 14 A, B, C, and D, uh, electrodes. But we have great control. All electrodes say the pH is 7, right at the set point. Normal set point uh, is often uh, 7 pH, uh, particularly for neutralization streams. 
the, they can't possibly all be exactly 7 pH. Also, the pH never moved. You move and test the electrodes in a process sample. Ah, uh, the technician. Uh, the electrodes still had on their protective caps with 7 pH buffer. This has happened a number of times. Another plan. The pH is moving during the batch where no reagent is added. Ah, I see where you have solid state reference electrode and its liquid production, uh, liquid jet junction potential does not reach equilibrium in this high ionic strength fluid before the batch is done. High ionic strength can be due to, due to um, high concentrations of strong S, strong bases, but it also could be actually more likely to, uh, to uh, high concentrations of salt ions. And this this has been the case in a lot of Monsanto processes. And so uh, what you really want is the flowing junction reference. It's the fastest and most precise, but it's not very popular in the United States because it requires a reservoir and pressurization of reservoir. And the pressurization must be such that it just provides a small positive flow out to the the junction. And when you calibrate it, you want to make sure that flow is very small so you don't contaminate the uh, the sample, you know, the little small volume you have there. And so, you know, there's a lot of reasons, I guess, why a flowing junction reference electrode is not used, even though they are the most precise. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we use uh, electrodes with double or triple junctions uh, to uh, s s slow down contamination and the effect uh, on the internal uh, electrode that's in the reference. Uh, but it slows down uh, the uh, equilibrium um, considerably. Uh, but even much, much lower, say, instead of the equal time to equilibrium taking minutes, and more like hours, possibly even a day, if you have a solid state reference electrode. And uh, the batch may be done before it reaches equilibrium. Meanwhile, the pH is shifting. Uh, and if you're going to calibrate these things, you really ought to use buffers with the same ionic strength and same type of ions, salt ions in there, and have them sitting in there and calibrate them to that um, and, and, and then um, put them in the plant. And in the plant, I guess they really need to be sitting in something in general like that, uh, waiting for the next batch. So. Uh, again, maybe a recirculation line with the batch process fluid captured there, unless it's going to coat the electrodes, is uh, the best the best thing you could do. Uh, you don't want electrodes sitting dry, uh, that's for sure, because uh, the, uh, the glass electrode uh, uh, surface requires a hydrated uh, layer there for it to respond, and if it becomes dry, uh, then it's it's going to be slow and not responsive, and it's going to take a while before it does hydrate after exposure to a process. And if the process doesn't have much water, you got a problem, even though it's in the process fluid, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, hydrated layer uh, not being as significant as it should be. Uh, plus, you you've got other problems in, in terms of uh, uh, shifts in reading and uh, and the life of the electrodes even possibly. Uh, so uh, also the true pH can be changing uh, just due to the amount of water that, that's in, even though, uh, you know, you haven't changed the amount of acid or bases in there, but just changing the amount of water in there is going to affect the activity of the hydrogen ion. And uh, and of course, with, uh, if, if there is a lot of salt concentrations, it's going to affect the activity of the hydrogen ion and then the pH. And um, there's some conjugate salt effects too that need to be uh, ion, uh, salt ion effects that also need to be addressed. Anyway, you can see that uh, uh, if you're going to test electrodes, you have to really uh, mimic uh, what is in the actual process in terms of uh, uh, calibration and uh, understanding what the response is going to be uh, of the actual uh, pH electrode.
Go to plant. We don't want to pay for a third pH electrode. At, at Monsanto, it was just a thing I grew up with, uh, was that we always had three electrodes in middle signal selection. You know, it was just a given. We knew it was that important because electrodes, man, that's the toughest measurement. And, you know, like I say, the life, even at best, is, you know, maybe a little more than a year. And, you know, it can be, uh, life can be a matter of weeks. It could be a matter of days. And, and things can be happening. All kinds of things can be happening uh, that uh, you, you didn't anticipate and, and don't understand. pH is critical, and each batch is worth more than a million dollars. This was a uh, high-value specialty chemical, and if, if you're talking about uh, biologics, you know, you know, for pharmaceuticals, it, it, it could be 10 million or more each batch, and and they tend to put in two electrodes, but can't understand the need for a third electrode. I said, if two electrodes disagree, which one is right? Is it worth 10000 to know, install that third electro? Eh, amazingly, it, it seems like the very simple concept is a hard sell. And I had one plant that uh, it was a bad installation. And, and so, uh, you know, when you had two or three electrodes, uh, putting a three was, you know, maybe worse because, you know, you had three screwed up electrodes. But uh, given that you have done a reasonable job with your installation, uh, having three electrodes in middle signal selection is it's got to be the way to go it, it, because uh, it, you inherently write out a sig single failure of any type. Some people have tried to design special logic, think they can do something better, but you can't take care of every situation. Uh, you can't know possibly every conceivable uh, failure mode. Well, here with middle signal selection, a single failure inherently of any type is protected. Now, once you have one failure, you better fix it because now you're vulnerable and you would need special logic to, to deal with a second failure. <coughs> Another plant said, hey, uh, we don't like three electrodes. They never agree. And this disagreement is a great source of knowledge. If one is slower than the other, it's either the, the glass electrode is, is, is dry or it's wearing out more likely or getting coated. So that's the one you need to replace. And this is very unpopular, but you probably ought to have electrodes of different vintage so that you only get a, a one to that needs to be replaced at any given time. It's not like they're all going to get coated or they're all going to be worn out at the same time. Uh, but this is hard for people to, to get into. If they replace electrodes, they just think, well, let's start with uh, three new electrodes. Uh, but really, you ought to have different lives of those electrodes in server so that you only have one failure at a time. I forgot to mention that uh, there's many other advantages of middle signal selection in terms of uh, reducing uh, the effect of noise without having to add a filter. Uh, also, sometimes a measurement will spike uh, due to uh, electromagnetic interference or some ground potentials. And often it's just one electrode. Well, if just one electrode spikes, it's going to be ignored through uh, signal selection. Uh, it's just incredible in terms of not only performance of the system, but also in terms of uh, the intelligence uh, uh, in the maintenance of a system because you're not, uh, actually it's less maintenance because you're not necessarily uh, working on electrodes uh, until you have an identified problem. And, you know, the two electrodes, they don't agree and the operator has one favorite. You know, he says, oh, Electro Day has always done me well, you know. So, uh, you know, you're going to be chasing uh, things that the operator is concerned about and uh, that really are not significant because electrodes are going to move around relative to each other and uh, they're not going to agree. And what may be high today may be low tomorrow and you can be chasing your own calibration adjustments if you don't have three electrodes and no signal selection. 
So War Story 15, Reagent Injection. Plant, we have been adding a basic reagent for 20 minutes into this vessel, and the pH has not increased from about 2 pH. What is wrong with the electrodes? Of course, you know, the first thing they would blame would be the electrodes. The, the three electrodes are all roughly reading 2 pH within 2 tenths of pH. Remove the electrodes and put them in a process sample of batch at its end point of about 8 pH. Plant. The electrodes read about 2 pH for the process sample we have. I tested the electrodes in buffer solutions and they read right. Now, what the heck is going on? Plant. The pH reading in the vessel Start increase after 90 minutes. Me, the reagent delivery delay is over an hour when the pump line is empty based on me, you know, taking a look at the size of the line and length of the line and the amount of flow you got in terms of GPH. Replace the metering pump with a control valve near the top of the vessel and check your pH um, for that batch sample with a lab electrodes before you, you blame our, you know, our, our electrodes used in the process. Check it with a lab electrode. Plant, the process sample beaker was contaminated with a residue of strong acid. And therefore, you know, the, even though the process sample was 8 pH with the residue, it was reading much lower. Well, it's a strong acid. It doesn't take a whole lot of residue to cause the pH to read much lower. Oh, and with the new reagent valve uh, near the top, uh, replacing that a pump sitting on the ground, eliminating that long reagent line, the patch pH control is great. Now, you still have to be careful about the dip tube because uh, dip tubes tend to be large uh, just due to the need for integrity of size. And so with a long dip tube, which, you know, the proper design normally for mixing is to have a dip tube that goes uh, halfway down or more you know, towards the impeller. And uh, the volume of that dip tube uh, can be several gallons. Well, uh, when the reagent flow stops, the processed fluid in the vessel backfills that dip tube. And that dip tube will eventually be just processed fluid. So when you start the reagent flow, you got to flush that out. Now, if you're only flowing a half a GPH or one GPH, it can take uh, an hour or more uh, to flush out that dip tube to, to see the effect of the reagent. Furthermore, when you stop the reagent, you're going to have uh, that inventory of reagent in that dip tube migrating out and getting into the processed food. So the pH is going to continue to change for the reagent after you stop the reagent flow. So I like to inject reagent into a feed line or a circulation line. If I can't do that, I would just make sure the dip tube is very short and just below the surface and that I have good axial mixing so that it pulls down the reagent uh, and you don't need that big dip tube. And so this is an example where conventional mixing guidelines really do not uh, work well for pH, and you have to have that understanding that because of these extremely low flows, uh, you know, where we're dealing with GPH, uh, we, we have a special situation. And furthermore, the mixing requirements itself is not understood even by the best. And here, uh, the modeler was uh, the company's expert in mixing, an exceptional uh, guy in terms of knowledge, Ph.D., and did all kinds of sophisticated models on how much mixing was required. So he, 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 at my request, he, he did a study based on what was needed for pH control. And he said, hey, the degree of mixing needed is not exceptional. Mixing uniformity of 1% will cause less than a 0.1 pH deviation. Now, I was perplexed because this was so counter to what my experience was. And so I asked him, what was the pH set point on the reagent? And the model said, I modeled a 5 pH process with acetic acid, a weak acid reagent. 
mean, well, for hydrochloric acid reagent on 7 pH set point, I have them in my process. The mixing uniformity requirement that I estimate is 100 times uh, more exact. It's 0.01%. In order to get a well-designed pH system, you have to be attentive to the whole uh, entire design, mechanical, equipment, typing, process. It, it's just not about the control loop. You have to be uh, into uh, the whole system uh, out there, uh, and uh, it requires this sort of insight as to some of the uh, situations you could get by with with less uh, loops with less sensitivity and rangeability requirements, although some of these things you wouldn't want in any situation of composition or temperature control. But uh, it's much more problematic uh, for pH. So I have uh, 12 mistakes here, and uh, we'll start out uh, with uh, the basic one, which is very common. Right off the bat, having missing inaccurate or erroneous titration curve. And then uh, mistake two, absence of a plan to handle failures, uh, startups, or shutdowns. Um, uh, this came from uh, actually uh, Nick Sands of DuPont. Uh, and, you know, you, you need to handle all the different situations and deal preemptively, uh, logically, and automatically with them. Mistake three, a single stage for set point at 7 pH. And here the key is if you have 7 pH, it's indicative probably of a strong acid, strong base, steep titration curve. Having just a single stage of neutralization is not going to be enough. Now, you maybe have a second stage just by an inline system in front of a, a vessel. Uh, so it may not have to be that expensive, but you need more than one stage of neutralization. Uh, mistake four, a horizontal tank. Oh, boy, for any sort of temperature and composition control, a horizontal tank is terrible in terms of mixing. I mean, uh, basically mixing uh, it can be visualized as occurring uh, in, a, in a zone that is approximately uh, cylindrical with a height of maybe uh, 100 to 150 percent of the diameter, uh, which is uh, just a little bit larger than the uh, diameter of the impeller. So it's that zone, uh, and with axial agitation, and, and uh, I guess I didn't mention that here, you want axial agitation. Uh, you don't want radial ag agitation, which may have been there for other reasons, like uh, maybe because they were worried about solids or something. I don't know. But you want to insist on axial agitation, and you want a vertical well mix tank. Uh, with a dimension such that the height of the tank is maybe at most 150% of the diameter of the tank. Here we have a horizontal tank, uh, really a bad uh, scenario. Mistakes five and six, a backfill dip tube. Uh, you can see that dip tube goes pretty far down. And uh, also the end of the dip tube is close uh, to where uh, the pump is uh, taking the fluid out of the, the vessel, the discharge from the vessel for recirculation and to go downstream. So we have short circuiting occurring from the dip tube uh, to the suction of the pump. It doesn't even get mixed with the rest of uh, what's in that uh, horizontal tank. Um, and, you know, with the pH coming in here, uh, it kind of wanders around here, eventually gets some good mixing here, but then kind of wanders around uh, before it gets out here and uh, is seen by the pH electrode. Now, uh, another mistake is uh, gravity flow because the, that means the reagent flow is going to be a function level. Uh, also, a uh, mistake is the valve then, for, particularly for gravity flow, that's too far away because uh, you, you, gravity flow, it's gonna, there's a transportation delay uh, from the valve to the vessel. Furthermore, as shown here, the valve has no position, uh, a disaster, a total disaster for any loop, but particularly a pH loop. Mistake time, this is less obvious, people don't understand this, uh, that electrodes emerge in a vessel. Uh, the, the velocity past the electrode 
is rarely uh, even approaching one foot per second. Now, if this electrode was close to the impeller, it might be around one foot per second. Once you get uh, even down to one foot per second or less, you tend to have much more coatings. And even if you're not coated, the electrode time constant goes up dramatically from, say, two seconds to maybe 20 seconds. Then if it gets coated, it can go up to 200 seconds. And so uh, here you have an electrode that's slow to begin with and then tends to get coated and you got to take it out and then taking it out. Hey, if it's a submerged thing, you got a whole kind of something to be able to chain and pulley thing to pull it out. It's, uh, it's not that easy a deal. So I tend never to have uh, these uh, electrodes particularly coming in through the top. Now in a vertical, uh, vessel and bioreactor, they tend to go in through the side uh, and point it down uh, at an angle uh, because there is no recirculation line. But probably though, you have a recirculation line where you can have a velocity of, say, above five feet per second. That not only minimizes the time constant but helps prevent coatings. However, if you put it in the suction of the pump here, uh, you're going to be more likely to see solids and, and debris and welding rod and uh, nuts and whatever's left over from maintaining or even building the vessel to begin with uh, are going to go by the electrode and break it, whereas they would have been caught by the pump strainer. Also, there may be bubbles here on the suction uh, of the pump. So you want it downstream of the pump, preferably 20 diameters, but unfortunately some people may put it up here uh, on the platform, uh, you know, at the top of the tank so they can uh, look at it there. Well, uh, there's a transportation delay, you know, and it's particularly large if there's a significant volume between here as shown with a heat exchanger. And so we have made uh, consumer improvements in several pH installations by uh, just moving uh, the electrode from being uh, up here to being much closer to the pump, and I say 20 pipe diameters, just maybe to uh, make sure that there is more uniformity in terms of the concentration at uh, that point. I encourage you to read this article in Chemical Processing. It, uh, it gets into a lot of these basic requirements, but also shows how you can uh, model a pH control system and get a good titration curve that includes the effect of uh, conjugate salts and CO2 and uh, uh, really g g give you a, a good indication of how you design the system and, and how you tune the system. Four stories, 17 through 18, set up. Well, we're talking about PID tuning now. And as we go to the new DCS systems, or go from one supplier to another. Unfortunately, the PID form and tuning settings differ from one supplier to another. Most uh, analog PID uh, use the series form, you know, whether it was pneumatic or electronic, where the derivative was computed in series. Uh, with other modes, and, and we're talking about those analog PID used in industry and not used in a laboratory um, or not, uh, you know, what's shown in publications because most textbooks, you know, using, whether in using control theory classes or just out there in general, show an independent form that is rarely used except for some PLCs. Most modern DCS use the ISA standard form, and that's what I would recommend. Many analog PID use a proportional setting in percent proportional band and a reset setting in repeats per minute, whereas the newer DCS PIDs use a proportional setting in uh, that's a gain, a dimensionless gain and a reset setting that's in time. And so the time uh, may be seconds. It, it should really say seconds per repeat so you understand the inverse relationship. 
but they just say seconds. Or they may say minutes instead of minutes per repeat. But you understand the inverse relationship and whether you're talking about minutes or seconds. Tuning setting units create inverse relationships in order of magnitude differences. If you don't, if you don't, you know, look into that and make sure you understand what those units are from the old system versus the new system. You also got to know what the form of the PID is in the old system versus the new system. Very few DCS have true external reset feedback dynamic reset limit, which uh, I've shown in publications and other presentations is so key uh, to really being able to make sure the PID does not try and change its output faster than what whatever it's manipulating can respond. And it adds in features like directional move suppression. I could go on and on and all the different benefits. So, um, but uh, manufacturers may say they have it, but really there's only a few uh, systems, uh, particularly new systems, uh, I have it. It was there in pneumatic PID controllers uh, inherently, but was lost when they went to analog PIDs by most manufacturers. And then they, when they first came out with the DCS, most manufacturers uh, again were kind of duplicating what they had in electronic analog and maybe improving on it, they thought, but uh, they lost that capability. And so it's, um, it's a largely misunderstood. Uh, uh, feature uh, that has, has such potential that uh, if you have it in your DCS, uh, you need to recognize and take advantage of it. Most PID loops on vessels and columns have an order of magnitude too much reset action, too small reset time. So, you know, if you have, uh, you know, something that's not doing well, either it's overshooting set point for a set point change or more likely it's just oscillating, slowly oscillating. Uh, what you can do, and it's normally, uh, you know, a uh, pretty conservative thing to do because uh, you're actually uh, uh, backing off from what the PID is trying to do, and, and you just increase the reset time by a factor of 10. And if it looks a little better, increase it by another factor of 10, so you have a factor of 100. And you may find that the oscillation goes away or is much less, or the overshoot is much less. Uh, and so uh, you really ought to tune the loop uh, and, and find out uh, what's going on. But often uh, the problem is the fact we have too much reset action and not enough gain action, particularly on vessels and columns. Now, it's a different situation if you have a plug flow going in an inline plug flow reactor or an extruder. You know, and that's a different situation. But if you have significant back mixing in a volume, um, and, or if you're talking about gas pressure control instead of liquid pressure control, you're talking about gas pressure control. You know, in general, these temperature, uh, composition, pressure, uh, level loops have way too much reset. And uh, some of my other presentations get into the fact that Often the gain that you could use is uh, much higher than what you did use, and if you didn't use that high gain, you need to increase the reset time uh, accordingly. In other words, if you're allowed to use a gain of 50, and say, oh, that's too much, so use a gain of 5, then whatever tuning setting you have for reset time needs to be increased by a factor of 10, because you decreased uh, the gain by a factor of 10. Um, so if you want get into that, you check out some of my uh, other presentations and uh, recordings. War Storage 17 A and B, gain and rate settings. Uh, plant 1 migration from an analog uh, to a DCS greatly improved column control. Boy, we really like the fact we did this migration. We're, we're, that whole column is, that was a very big column, a very important column. Greg, well, the analog PID had a proportional gain of 100%, which you then directly inserted without conversion and giving a PID gain of 100 instead of the 1 that you had before. The level control was previously oscillating from integral action being greater than proportional action because the gain was only 1. Level controllers can use a very high gain, often even higher than 100, unless there's noise or you don't want tight control. For a level PID manipulating reflex flow, the high gain helped 
The material balance provided much better inherent internal reflex control, improving the whole column control tremendously. Another plan, migration from an old to a new TC has caused a temp caused temperature loop oscillations. You have rate time settings larger than reset time settings in, that were in the old TCS, but since the old TCS used a series form, the oscillation did not develop due to the inherent interaction in time domain. And if you're really into this, and the frequency response, it corresponds to non-interaction in the frequency domain. But there's this interaction in the time domain that inherently eliminates the dominance of derivative action by effectively reducing uh, the uh, integral action or proportional action you get through the interaction factor. And there are equations uh, which I have in publications uh, showing exactly how to compute any of these things we've been talking about. Uh, in the new DCS with a default ISA standard form, the rate must be less than the reset time. Preferably, a rate time less than one-fourth the reset time. So, you know, in a series form, they had the rate time greater than the reset time. And it worked great. You put it in uh, the new uh, DCS with the with the standard from ISA. You think everything's going to be great. And now you have oscillations because you didn't recognize that the rate must be significantly less than the reset time. Four story 18, reset setting. Uh, I think I've, I've done this a number of times, but we'll do it quickly. And uh, I think it's very instructive because this happened to me in a number of control rooms. So. Uh, and at first I thought, well, maybe something is wrong with BID. But uh, look at uh, the situation and think whether the steam valve or water valve should be open for this liquid reactor, or we have a temperature control that's split range between steam or water, depending on whether we want heating or cooling. So the operator looks at face plating, or maybe he's just looking at digital displays of numbers on, on his graphic. And here, uh, the process variable temperature is 48 degrees and the set point is 52 degrees. He's looking at this, and it's a slow loop. And he's thinking, what the heck is going on here? Because the water valve is open. I'm, you know, my temperature hasn't reached that point. I'm waiting for this, you know, start up or batch. You know, and I'm waiting for it to reach that point. Do something wrong with the PID algorithm or the tuning. You got to get that steam valve open. And so, if you were to tune it, to make that happen, what would you do? You would add integral action because it wouldn't open. It wouldn't open the the, the water valve until it had crossed set point and the temperature had gotten greater then the set point then would open the water well. So if you, somebody comes in here and tuning it, that's what they would do. They'd add more reset action. And, uh, and then the operator would be happy at first, but then you'd wonder why is there overshoot and why is there oscillations occurring. But, you know, the digital displays, uh, particularly if you're displaying, uh, you know, numbers past the decimal point, really gets people obsessed with things and, and leading to wrong conclusions. Whereas, if you look at the trend chart, and you have it intelligently time-scaled, that's a problem. Because if you just bring up the trend chart that happens automatically clicking on the faceplate, it's not intelligently time-scaled. Uh, you need a scale that's going to show a past history uh, enough of when it's happening to get the trajectory. Uh, and then you can zoom in if you want. But uh, you need to understand the trajectory. And once you understand that, you see that... Uh, with this dotted line where it's going in the future, uh, this dashed line, uh, that if uh, you wait to uh, the process variable is cross set point, uh, it's going to overshoot. To, uh, if you wait till then for it to open uh, uh, the water valve, and because there's a dead time, and there's significant dead time in these loops, and due to you know heat transfer surfaces and and uh, thermal wells, whatever. And so uh, it's significant dead time, and it's going to significantly overshoot. Now, with this understanding, you will not be so insistent at this point here before the dash line uh, that the steam valve 
um, be open. If integral action dominates, the water valve won't open until the error changes sign, and that's that's too late. Work stories 19 and 20 about output limits and any reset wind-up limits. I added this based on uh, a question I got after uh, I did the original WebEx. Uh, plant, uh, one, there seems to be, uh, uh, the PID seems to be uh, slow recovering from a closed and wide, and from a wide open position. But there are new valves with the latest uh, smart positioners. You know, with the, the new valves and latest smart positioners, why don't we have better control uh, when we're recovering from the closed or wide open positions? Well, uh, engineer looking at this. The old valves had excessive backlash, and the positions were notorious for being out of calibration of 5% or more, necessitating PID output limits of a minus 10%, 110% on the valve signal to make sure the valve was fully closed and fully open, respectively. And that's what you kept. I mean, you just copied the, you know, the configuration. Um, and uh, for a new smart position, you should have set the output limits to 0 and 100% for the valve signal. Now, the PID output limits when they're driving the set point of a secondary loop in a cascade control must be set to match the secondary loop set points in proper units. This was actually very bad in the beginning when smart positioners first came out. And if you actually set the output limit to minus 10%, you know, it's getting its power from the, the, the milliamp signal coming in, and the milliamp signal is so low that these uh, uh, early on these new uh, smart positioners would go to sleep. They would go to sleep and because uh, they didn't have enough power to figure out what was going on. Now, I think that's been corrected, but uh, in general, you still shouldn't uh, in gen uh, have that, that output going that far negative uh, uh, for these uh, new positioners and, and uh, new valves. Plant two. Uh, the new DCS goes crazy when the PID output goes above 100. The new DCS output scale is an engineering unit where the old DC output scale was 0 to 100% and percent. That in this case should match those of the secondary loop set point. The default the default value of the output limit and the AI reset wide nut limits are 0 to 100, even though, you know, you would think uh, they would be more intelligent and that they would change as you change the output scale, but they don't. They just stay at a 0 to 100. You corrected the output limits, uh, but not the anti-reset wind-up limits, resulting in reset action that was 16 times what was, this, what was set per the reset tuning setting. Uh, which is that 16 times is the normal ARW action to unwind when you're uh, when outside uh, the high limit, uh, which was unfortunately left at its default of 100. So we finish up here the top 10 things you don't want to hear in a project definition meeting. Uh, I don't want a, any smart instrumentation talking back to me. Let's study each loop to see if the valve really needs a positioner. Let's slap actuators and piping valves and use them for control valves. Oh, that happened so many times over the, so many decades, dating all the way back to the 70s. We just need to make sure control valve spec requires the tight shut shutoff. What is the big deal about process control? We, we just set the flow per the PFT. When I talked to uh, process control chemical engineers, this is, was uh, their initial thoughts uh, and comments, and also it was an initial thought that came out of when I was trying to set up the certification automation professional program and some questions, and they, they, they just didn't get it, why you would need maybe a mass flow meter to tell you what the concentration was in the line. They said, well, it, it's a, the concentration is what on the process flow diagram. Well, the process hardly ever exactly agrees with the process flow diagram. Uh, it would, may, that would be a temporary situation. Often the process flow diagrams are out of date, and of course they don't show what happens during disturbances. Therefore, you know, an ideal situation that may not exist. 
just make sure all the flows and process variables are constant. And I've had process engineers say this, a number of them in different industries. Well, the control loop functions by transferring variability from the controlled variable, the process variable, to the manipulated variable, which is often a flow. And you have a choice through the tuning now how much you want to transfer. If you want tight control of the process variable, you got to be able to move around the manipulated flow. You can't keep both of them uh, constant. And often process engineers will think, well, I don't want to let that, give that, you know, up to a, a controller of a PID that I don't understand. So what they tend to do, particularly uh, for batch operations is they tend to want to uh, sequence and schedule flows rather than putting in a PID controller to control temperature or, or composition for fed batch control, uh, particularly in a reactor, a bioreactor, and um, or even dissolved oxygen control or pH control. And they want to sequence the the flows to to the vessel. And you can't possibly take care of all the situations, particularly as the batch is changing and unknowns that occur. Uh, uh, but they're reluctant to give it up to the PID controller because of this uh, lack of understanding that, uh, you know, the PID controller is going to do what really is needed continuously, attentively, if it's well-tuned, and, and do it so much more repeatably and exactly than you can do with any sort of scheduling, no matter how intelligent you come up with with flows um, based on certain, you know, conditions you think and a certain batch time. Oh, you don't want to hear that, uh, hey, the operators can tune the loops. Uh, there was one plant site where this is what happened. Even crazier, I should have put in here, was the fact that all the tuning settings were at the default done and during tieback loop testing, uh, where the default uh, tuning setting set for tieback loop testing and operator training uh, had a gain of one and a reset in terms of repeats per minute of one. And amazingly enough, the loops were never tuned. And uh, the whole plant would be operating for maybe five years when I found out about this. And in the meantime, the operators were trying to tune the loops. And in some cases, you know, they were getting these oscillations, and they said, well, we'll just have on-off control, essentially, by narrowing the output limits. So it just bounced back and forth between the output limits, and if we needed to make it asymmetrical or something, uh, you know, we can have the output limits not exactly uh, centered on the output scale. Anyway, they got pretty, uh, pretty, uh, you know, creative, uh, but it basically uh, incredibly uh, wrong thing. Amazing that the planet could operate. Let's do the project for half the money and half the time. Boy, you know, if this happens so much, if maybe not to this degree, half the money, half the time, but the emphasis is so much on, on uh, schedule and cost, not on performance. Let's go with package equipment and let the package supplier select and design a low-cost automation system. Cheap, cheap. I should have had another cheap up there. Incredibly bad. You, you need to insist that the package supplier use the same instrumentation that you have standardized in the rest of the plant. Uh, and, and you got to make sure that the, that the installation is right in terms of the location um, uh, uh, and, and how the measurements are physically connected and, and piped up. Let's go out for bids and have purchasing picks the, pick the best deal. And that, that started to happen to me before I retired. So here's some comic relief. A lot of these uh, stories are, are something akin to them are in these uh, books here. So uh, you get some insight and some humor. Good news is uh, these books are pretty small and they only cost maybe $20. And it's actually a technical book here uh, that I have been read from cover to cover, and even spouses have appreciated this one here. Um, just 
just maybe from the humorous aspects of it. And there was a sequel, part 1.523, uh, 52.3% more entertaining. That was my <laughs> publicity stunt uh, than the original. And then we did a logical thought, and we wanted to go under pseudonym of G.S. McWiener, but people didn't realize it was really still me and Stan. So the sales of this, this book was uh, not that great, even though I thought it was a, a great book. And maybe the subtitle, a 99.99% fact-free book, you know, I was just joking, <laughs> uh, didn't, didn't help the sales. And then dispersing heat through conviction, uh, and I, I think this is one where I include a, a lot of the remarks that were recorded in the control room. Operators were saying really funny things, uh, and without trying to be funny. And they had, I guess they kind of knew that they were entertaining, so they had a log of them, and, uh, and I've got that dispersed throughout the book. Uh, then a lot of the stories we covered right here are in here. This book, uh, which was very early on published by ISA, but then, you know, went out of print, and so I put it back in print through uh, Momentum Press and uh, changed uh, the name, the title. Uh, more recently, uh, much more recently, I uh, published this book, which is mostly just a book of cartoons, so you don't even have to read uh, much text except for what's in the cartoon and, uh, and dialogue. And then uh, this one, since uh, I've been, you know, I'm close to retirement, kind of phasing out, but still involved. Um, I'm looking at what is the funnier side of retirement for engineers and people of technical persuasion. Of course, my co-author here, Stan Weiner, has been completely retired, except for, you know, us getting together uh, since uh, the 1990s, late 1990s. Oh, uh as far as questions, uh, we did have one from Hector, and uh, he asked, uh, uh, what about uh, backlash and, and fiction? What is the difference between the two? And um, uh, backlash is, uh, is lost motion that occurs due to play and linkages principally, and if you, you don't literally have a a pin and a slot and a link, you can see it. Uh, the pin has to move from one end of the, the slot to the other for when you reverse direction for you to actually uh, get the uh, shaft or stem to move. And this is really bad for rotary valves, but particularly bad for dampers. Um, uh, a, a, a lot of play, and it's a lost motion. But it can occur amazingly for connections you wouldn't think are that loose. Uh, for example, the, the pin connection or the key lock connections uh, have some play in there, uh, amazingly enough. And so you have that backlash, and it's apparent when you only when you reverse direction. If you're making changes in the same direction, uh, you don't see it. And, and so if you're talking about small signal changes of uh, a tenth of a percent and the resolution is perfect, uh, you're going to see the valve respond a tenth of a percent in the same direction. Now you reverse direction, and uh, if your backlash is one uh, percent, you're going to have to make ten of these one. 0.1% changes for the valve to start to move in the other direction. Furthermore, when it does move, it's not going to make up for that 1% dead band on reversal. Uh, it's lost motion. So, you know, you make 10 of these moves, and then you make one more and a tenth of a percent, and it'll only move a tenth of a percent. It won't move 1.1%. Uh, now, in stiction, uh, it, it corresponds to a resolution uh, limit that you see moving in any direction. And uh, it can't respond to changes smaller than uh, the resolution. So if the resolution is 0.5%, uh, you'd have to make uh, a total changes of tenth of a percent that would exceed that. So for the first... Uh, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5% in the same direction. There's no movement. Then you go to 0.6%, and it's going to jump and make up, uh, and it's going to match that 0.6% change. 
Uh, now in reverse direction, you're going to have the same situation. So it does show up as dead band. And so dead band, uh, when you reverse direction, part of it is due to resolution and the other part is due to backlash. And now backlash, uh, is less problematic in that even though it's counterintuitive, you can reduce the amplitude of the oscillations that occur. And you can get a limit cycle which is a constant amplitude oscillation, if you have two or more integrators anywhere in the system, whether it's in the position or process or control or cascade control. But you can reduce the amplitude uh, proportionally to an increase in gain. So you go with a higher gain, and uh, you can reduce the amplitude and reduce the period, getting much better control. Now, if you only have one integrator, you're not going to have a limit cycle, and actually you can do even better in terms of tighter control by increasing the gain, which is counterintuitive, uh, and so people don't, don't realize that. And there's things you can do in terms of designing the PID control algorithm um, to, like on reversal, to kind of go beyond uh, the signal reversal so that you know that the valve is actually going to move. Uh, and so you can have that intelligent... Uh, um, configuration going on in your PID, or you can put in a lead lag, which is what is in some smart positioners that they're now saying, oh yeah, hey, this is good news. Uh, I was at the Emerson Exchange, that was one talk was strictly on, oh hey, the value of turning on the lead lag and the positioner. And it, the lead will kind of help zip through um, both the resolution and the backlash, but particularly with the backlash, it's a I think um, you see um, more of the benefit. Uh, now, if you have external reset feedback with a fast readback of the actual uh, valve position, uh, you can eliminate uh, also uh, oscillations. Uh, and uh, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it, you, you may end up with an offset uh, from, from the set point. So it's still, you don't want backlash or resolution, but uh, you can minimize its effect uh, by uh, having a fast readback uh, of the actual internal valve position. And remember, if you have a piping valve posing as a throttling valve, you don't have a representative readback of what the ball or disc is doing. Um, but if you have a good representative meeting, reading and it's fast, it's being updated fast enough, turning that on can help if the valve is slow or it's got backlash or stiction, you know, it's so valuable in, in, in general dealing with any of the problems with the valve or whether, you know, it's got this poor position or sensitivity for small changes, um, all, all those things. And then um, there was another question from uh, Hector. It said, you know, on the booster, uh, you showed the bypass valve. And, and the fact that uh, you have uh, suggested enlarged tubing and large connections. And, uh, and, and typically I've, I've gone up and increased the tubing connection size to one inch, but sometimes larger. Uh, the, the bypass on the booster is important, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so that the positioner does not see that small volume only, but sees a little bit of of the large volume of the actuator, which it needs for stability uh, in, in, in doing its own, you know, uh, pressure control. Um, anyway, uh, uh, that about sums it up. Oh, also, uh, I had put in there the fact that Hunter said, hey, if you want to make that valve faster by using a booster, high volume booster, you got to make sure that the uh, uh, the air supply lines um, uh, are enlarged to booster and are, de and are dedicated to each individual booster uh, and uh, not being shared by uh, any other user of the air supply. Even if, you, you know, you don't want the same airline to be used by the positioner that's being uh, used by the booster. That, and that needs to be a separate air supply line. So thank you all. Uh, that's it. And I uh, look forward to next month when uh, Danica Jordan is going to do uh, another WebEx on some things that she has experienced and also give us an update on ISA and what's happening there and maybe what we can do uh, to help our 
a technical society, which means so much for our profession. I mean, we, to get the recognition and advancement of the profession, uh, we, we need to be involved in ISA, and, and we need to be able to recognize also and use the ISA standards, uh, incredible wealth of information there that um, I think is uh, not fully recognized or fully utilized. Uh, thank you very much.